Hello and welcome to the good, the scars and the rugby along with our friends at Allianz. I'm Alma Smith. This is episode three and it's different to the previous two because we don't have Mike Tindall joining us. He's on new dad duties after the birth of Lucas on the bathroom floor on Sunday night. There's a blow by blow account of exactly how that went down on this week's episode of the good, the bad, the rugby. Uh, we have, however, called in off the bench, the finisher, James Haskell. <laughs> Hello. What, what an intro. What an intro. <laughs> Nobody's that excited to see me ever. And do you know what? Our, our erstwhile producer, um, uh, you know, called me and he said, I'll ask, because I said to him on the show, when am I going to get on the good of scars and the rugby? And I love saying it. The more I say it, the more uh, uh, <laughs> Emily freaks out. Because he still isn't accustomed to it. Um, and he said, do you know what? I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's your cup of tea. Alex Payne said, listen, if I came on, it would lower the tone. They'd started so well. There's a high level of sophistication. Talking to, talking to Sarah Orch, it's going to be a big day. And then, lo and behold, James, we need you. The little bat signal went up, the little H in the sky, and here I am. I was going to say, I wish I had Go time earlier in the day to send you like a, a do's and a don'ts. Right. Uh, Emily, you are back from two days in England camp before I bring in our guest. Just give us an account of how that was. Yeah, it's good. Um, we were actually at Twickenham, so that was cool. We trained on the pitch, I assume, before they, they rip it up because of the Six Nations is done. So yeah, that was cool. Um, yeah, good, good just to get stuck into it. Pretty smash and grab, like just the two days, but um, really, really good. And like Six Nations is now a week and a bit away. So yeah, starting to kind of hone in on some of the Scotland stuff and that, but yeah. Yeah, it was a good camp. The sun was out, which definitely always helps. And our guest this week, uh, as James has already alluded to, a qualified rugby coach and referee, but that's probably not what you know her for. She's an integral part of the BBC's rugby commentary team, both on TV and radio. She was the first woman to commentate on the game in the UK, covering England versus Fiji back in 2016. Welcome to BBC Radio 5 Live's Sarah Orchard. It's great to have you on The Good, The Scars and the Rugby. Thank you. I can tell you've been Googling me, Elmer, which makes me very nervous. So thank you for having me. <laughs> I actually was, it, it changed the horizons kind of I had in my head for what I could be when I came to the UK in 2015 for the Rugby World Cup. And I heard and saw so many amazing women like yourself covering rugby. It I promise you, it changed the, as I say, it was like someone took the guardrails off and I went, oh, we can do all these things. Look at that. So you are, are certainly a, like a personal favorite of mine. Um, and, and Emily's smiling really broadly. Um, everyone seems really giddy about having you on the show. So that's great. Let's start with you and rugby. Um, is it true that you've just been a pioneer since before broadcasting and that you helped form the first girls team uh, back at school in Exeter? Oh my goodness. I mean, what an introduction, first of all. I mean, I, I just need to come to you guys if I ever need like a little <laughs> bit of a pep up, you know, uh, way to go. No, yeah, so basically I sort of was first introduced to rugby. I went to one of those schools in the UK. It's a private school, so it means in the sixth form they were traditionally just for boys. And then I joined and in the sixth form there was 12 girls and like 200 boys. Uh, so our netball team was rubbish. Uh, we used to play the local college that had about a thousand uh, women. Yeah, we got absolutely thumped. You know, we didn't even have a proper subs bench. It was terrible. Um, so we were like, well, why don't we try rugby? And there was a girls' school down the road. So they came along as well. I can't claim to be a pioneer. It was a group of us that got it together. So, um, and yeah, I, I got into it that way. And sort of a story I tell a lot is I got into the England Academy quite early. And there was a very young girl called Danielle Waterman, who was about five years younger than me, who was running circles around me. And it was at that point I kind of thought, maybe I'm not going to go the whole way in this. There was also a, a real, uh, I, I don't like using the words like bruiser when it comes to women because they sometimes take it the wrong way, but Kim Oliver was not nice to me when she handed me off in those academy sessions. And Emily Scarrett is smiling because she knows what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, she was stood next to you most of the time. She was opposite me. So uh, yeah, it, it was a good introduction to the rugby world to say the least. 
Yeah, Kim Oliver is definitely somebody that you wanted on your team, not against you. She's the, she, she played 10, 12, and she's a sort of 10 or 12 that basically if the nine threw a bad pass, she'd literally kick it back at them. Like, I'm not having that. Try, like, try again. Like, proper old school, but a really good girl, so I can, I can well imagine. So you played rugby and then started refereeing as well, and that is such a cool thing to kind of I'm sure be able to kind of step into any conversation with well you know I did a bit of refereeing myself as well um, and I love that you say that you you kind of use it as a way to just be involved in the sport but I'm sure that's also paved the way for what you've done since. Yeah it was a really interesting one because after I finished university I went off and I was lucky enough to travel the world in 2003 funnily enough we ended up in Australia and we got to follow England all the way through to the final and having witnessed that as a fan, I got, when I came back to the UK, I was like, I've got to carry on in rugby, but I can't really play anymore, particularly when you're in the broadcasting arena, I was getting off work funny hours and I couldn't commit to a team. So I thought, yeah, I'll go for it and referee. Um, and I was actually at the Devon uh, Society with one, another youngster called Luke Pierce, who overtook me in that field as well. There's all these young people who've overtaken me. Um, but I was working at BBC Radio Devon doing traffic and travel and things and I loved rugby and yeah just you take the opportunities when they come along but I can't pretend in any way I ever set out to be a rugby commentator because who ever heard of a woman doing commentary in any sport when I was sort of in my teenage and young 20s it just didn't exist everyone just talked about Bill McLaren all the time when it came to rugby um, and I loved you know listening to his commentaries on the TV but me doing it no didn't seem a possibility at the time but uh yeah somehow fell into it and uh here we are today i'm fascinated with with both El elm and sarah i'll tell you why because you know tv in itself and is a like a male dominated environment like it, it's hard enough to do that and then you decide to bolt on an even more male dominated environment that you want to work as so a tv you're like do you know what that's that's you know too easy. I'm going to then go bolt on sport. I mean, how? I mean, I'll be a question to both of you, really. I mean, to, to Sarah maybe first. Like, how did you find that early early journey? Like, because getting into TV must have been super intimidating, and and, and radio. Well, it's probably uh, one you could actually ask because I made a lot of mistakes, and luckily I made a lot of mistakes in a time when sort of social media didn't exist. And the sort of mistakes that I made, I actually did work experience at Sky Sports under one Alex Payne when he was there. And you can probably remember my work experience days. I didn't have a clue what I was doing. I probably made the most embarrassing impression ever. I, I think I was taken to a game by a producer and a cameraman as a test. And I didn't know what to do during the game. So when the game was on, I was like, well, what am I meant to be doing? I mean, obviously you're meant to be there watching the game. I went and got the producer and the cameraman chips because I thought they might be hungry during the game. You know, who, that's ridiculous. But I thought maybe that's what you do. I'm not there as a runner. Anyway, I got it all wrong. It takes you a long time to learn. And luckily, as I said, I made a lot of mistakes along the way. Uh, to get where I'm now. Don't buy people chips when a game is on is my main advice there. What about you, Elma? <laughs> That's really practical advice. I love it. Um, I think for me, it was, I'd already worked in TV. So in like music TV with a Mohawk and kind of rock and roll bands and interviewing <laughs> Jared Leto for five years, because I started in radio when I was in high school and I started in TV when I was still studying law. And so I had had a bit of time kind of trudging along in TV and realized that I wanted to be as close to live and as close to the most challenging thing I could find. Obviously, I was 24 and crazy. And um, when Supersport said they were looking for a woman reporter to take to a Rugby World Cup for the first time ever, um, that was like, what's the worst that can happen? Um, and that was, that was, I mean, I was stupid and young enough to kind of go, if this flops terribly, which it could, um, I'll, I've still got time and like, I can go back to interviewing kind of musicians. Speaking of musicians though, you've done some interesting stuff in, in pursuit of, you know, your love for rugby and seeing it up close. You went to the 2003 Rugby World Cup. You just mentioned that, uh, down under but you didn't work there. How did you pay for that trip again? 
oh gosh, <laughs> I did a lot of jobs in a lot of terrible places. Um, I think I, I could be wrong. I think the job, I worked in a box factory, uh, sort of 12 hour shifts. And it was when Harry Potter wasn't even a full box set. I think it was just, they were only up to book number five at that point. And my job was to pick up the five box set from one conveyor belt and turn around and put it on that conveyor belt for 12 hours with breaks. I did that. That's how I paid to go to the World Cup in 2003. So yeah, I did a few bar jobs as well. But yeah, you, w w when you want to go, and believe me, it, it was worth it in the end. But I did have one big regret about that trip because we didn't have tickets for the final. We had tickets all the way up until the semi-final, but didn't have final tickets. And we got them in the end by someone said, oh, just ring this phone line. They do a last release of tickets on the Tuesday before the game. And we were like, you're kidding. They were like, no, just ring the number. We rung the number, me and my best mate on the phone. They go, yeah, sure. How many do you want? I said two. What an error. Stupid you could have made a million. Tickets. Oh, I could have paid for the whole trip, Emily. I was just like, I could have had up to eight. I bought two. And we didn't realize until about three days afterwards because we were so excited we had tickets for the final. So yeah, massive error. We, we live and we learn, but it was still worth it. So there you go. I've learned two things in this podcast. Sorry, don't buy chips for people doing high pressure jobs. <laughs> and if you get free opportunities to buy tickets, always get more so you can scout them. Like never, yeah. Definitely. I mean, I could have told you, I could have told you the last one before. The chips at work thing, I, I think they're just being fussy. Like unless you're operating some sort of heavy machinery or you're resting a packet of chips on a, on a, surgeon's, on a surgeon's patient while they're doing heart, open heart surgery. <laughs> Offering a cameraman, the cameraman's just got to do that. He can surely go like this. I would. <laughs> ungrateful. True. Ungrateful they are. <laughs> so, um, Emily, where were you during that 2003 Rugby World Cup? What are your recollections of it? Where did you watch the final? Yeah, I just remember being at home. So I was 13 for the 2003 World Cup final. So I was very much involved with rugby, but kind of no aspirations. I wasn't at a level whereby, you know, I wanted to become a rugby player or, you know, I wanted to play for England, anything like that. I, did, I just loved it. So I just remember sitting in my front room with, uh, I think my whole family, mum, dad and brother, just watching it. And I remember, the, I remember when Johnny obviously kicked the very iconic drop goal at the end and just going ballistic. And that's not really like me or my family. We're not particularly kind of, um, over elaborate people and I just remember it was mad it was absolute madness and, and ever since now when I watched that drop goal you get the goosebumps because it takes you back to that kind of young 13 year old self surrounded by your family it's yeah that that's kind of my memory of it I think that then made me ask my dad if I could have he think he'd make me a set of goalposts so that I could go and practice my kicking out in the garden so we went and did that blessing with a couple of round bales very farmer um, so yeah, that that's that kind of kickstarted it all. I think. James, you were with wasps, hey? Already. Yeah, I was. Yeah, I mean, I asked my dad to build me um, a pair of kicking posts to prove my kicking, and um, he he, he, <laughs> he took my boots and threw them in the bin. And and there was a consensus that I was never allowed to ever try to kick the ball. So that's what that's how my childhood went. Um, yeah, I was actually uh, training with wasps. So I'd had my first pre-season while I was still at school with Wasps. So I'd actually been training and playing with Lawrence and, uh, you know, obviously there was quite a big contingent in a World Cup, Simon Shaw, um, Stuart Abbott, Josh Lucy. I'd done a pre-season with them and, and played with them and stuff and had the warm-up and then gone home, gone back to normal school rugby and then sort of had that moment where I was watching the World Cup. And for me, I was closer to it than, well, closer to those guys than anything else. And Jordan, it, did, it inspired me, but also made me, uh, hugely jealous because I full, I sort of appreciated how big a moment this was in the sand. You know, for a lot of people, it was kind of, it was exciting, but I'm always one of these people that I think, oh, you know, this is where I want to be. This is my motivation. Like, how do I do this? Oh, God, I can't believe I wasn't involved. This is going to be life changing. Just think about that. And uh, it kind of, it, you know, uh, inspired me. And because I wasn't that far removed, I, I was much more like, oh, I wish it had been me. Obviously I was terrible then, but, and I was no, nowhere near the World Cup squad, but the thought counts, you know. That is such James Haskell energy. Sarah, I was delighted. Um, you told uh, Nick Heath on his podcast that with the first time someone wanted you to do commentary, you were like, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that that's what I want to do. Is that correct? Oh, well, yeah, because I, I can remember it was my boss. We were in the office and he said, I need a commentator for this Wasps game this weekend. I think it was Wasps London Irish. And he said, Sarah, you can do it. And I just went, can I? 
And again, it was that whole thing of, I asked, can I? Because again, I didn't hear women commentating. I didn't understand that this was an actual career path and a possibility for me. I found it quite bizarre, to be honest. Um, so yeah, so he said, yeah, you can do it. Um, and we did a few tests in the end. I think randomly, one of my test games was England Wales in their World Cup warm up match uh, at Twickenham before the 2007 World Cup. Uh, bizarre. And that sort of blew my mind slightly because that was one of the first times I'd been at Twickenham uh, to do commentary and been in the commentary gantry. So that sort of blew my mind as well. And when you get little tastes of things like that, you're like, yeah, this is what I want. This is pretty cool. Um, and again, though, I got a lot of opportunities that I don't think women get these days, which is uh, and men as well, I have to say, this isn't just a women thing when it comes to commentary. I did loads of my commentaries when what was just then in online um, and they were for small audiences. So they weren't sort of like thrown onto the TV or the main radio stations straight away. It took me, I got a good couple of years behind, under my belt before I actually got thrown into the big bad mix of the uh, scary world that is broadcasting. I'm, I remember speaking to Emily about, um, you know, how did she appreciate that she was now part of an aspirational pathway for, for young girls that when you know, I asked her when we, you know, we've, we've had her on the, the other podcasts and stuff and over the years you know she had, didn't have many idols to look up to you know do both of you now appreciate that there is a girl sitting somewhere that goes there isn't a glass ceiling anymore I can commentate I can I can do that it must be quite a nice a nice thought for both of you when I don't you know Alma, what was I mean you obviously started in music stuff I'd, I'd love to know kind of what that path was like did you did you did you see a pathway or were you like just you know, risky it all and just going, I'm going to have a go at this. Do you know what's so crazy? When I was at university, I reported on football for, because I did journ post-grad and part of our journ responsibilities, uh, we had to bring out a newspaper for the university and I reported on football and it never occurred to me that I could do this in rugby, even though rugby was my first love and I went to a school that produced loads of springboks and grew up in a house where everyone was rugby nuts. But it, even as a postgraduate student, it had not occurred to me, not once, that this was an actual gap. And I'm interested, Emily, in, in terms of your development as a rugby player, what it meant for you to start hearing women like Sarah pop up in commentary and hearing women speaking very authoritatively about the game, not only playing it and, and coaching, but actually having a very overt role in the media. Yeah, it's awesome. I think like Sarah, the way Sarah speaks about rugby, her knowledge of rugby is exactly the same as any men, probably if not better than some of them that you, that you would ever come across. So actually, again, it's that moment of why why hasn't this been happening? Because there's so many women that, that know and understand the very difficult game that is rugby. Um, yeah, it, it's brilliant to, brilliant to see. I think all the girls really appreciate it when you have those female role models not obviously in the sense of us aspiring to be necessarily in that that vein but just strong powerful women like you say putting their putting themselves in in that kind of space um there's loads of obviously girls that are taking it up now you think of like referees ars lots of them kind of as james said breaking glass ceilings now in terms of of what they're doing and i think we're just trying to like i, I hope we're past that point but normalizing that um and not having to you know, keep announcing when a female ref is ref in a men's game or a women's commentator is commentating on a men's game like that. That that's just what happens now because they know and they understand the game and they can they can articulate themselves in a way which you know the the viewers can kind of connect with. I'm, I'm fascinated because we've obviously been quite been quite positive, right? And I learned very quickly with my with wife in particular that it's, that sexism is a, sexism is alive and real. And um, because we have these good conversations about lots of things, it doesn't necessarily mean we're progressing. I, you know, I interviewed um, Natalie Pinkham from um, you know, the Formula One about, again, you know, it's, a, it's an 81% male dominated thing, 91% white demographic in that particular thing. And I said to her, you know, what, what was your journey like? Was it, were you accepted? Because there's a lot of old buffers with a lot of old mentality around there. And one of them actually said to her, uh, you know, when she was talking about being pregnant and being a woman and kind of stuff, and they were like, look, you know, it's absolutely fine to be pregnant, but remember, there's, you know, 30 younger girls ready to take your job. And that's like, that bloke doesn't work at Sky anymore, but the concept is, that it can't have all been roses. There must have been, there must have been a few people going, listen, come on, make the tea and be quiet. 
Well, the, the main thing you find being a woman in a rugby press environment, and I'm sure Elma will have had this, I don't even have to ask her, she'll probably just nod, is that if you are in a press room, every man who walks into the room who is new to that room will walk in and ask you where the team sheets are because they think you are the press officer. It is that simple. She's laughing because it happens all the time. And it, it's, it's when the same person does it three games in a row, you're a bit like, I'm not the press officer. Um, so yeah, so you have that and you just learn to live with it and you learn to laugh. That's fine. Um, actual sort of sexism and stuff. I have to say my fellow commentators have all been uh, amazing. I mean, I don't even want to list them because I worry I, I would miss one, but like Ian Robertson, Chris Jones, Miles Harrison, um, Alistair Eakin, all of them, Nick Mullins, every single one of them has helped me on my journey. There's never been a question I haven't been able to ask them and they haven't been delighted to help me. They're all brilliant. Um, so, so that's great. And I just, I'll be honest, you do need a, a sort of a, a bit of a hard core within you when you do get some of the sexist stuff that does happen on social and stuff. Um, but like, I always think who, who's the most important opinion that counts your boss because they're going to employ you again so were they happy yeah they're happy they're going to employ you again that's a good step your parents yeah maybe your partner and then like i remember when i was working at the 2015 world cup i got this tap on my shoulder and i sort of turned around and this guy just said to me i've listened to you you're good keep doing it and then he walked off and it was dick best and i was just like I've never met Dick Best before in my entire career. He was working for ITV, former England uh, head coach. And I was just like, that's pretty cool. Uh, and he didn't have to do that. But it, they're the sort of moments that you live off and you actually care about. The rest of it, I'll be honest, you know, if, if it's one person who has 10 followers and a dog, they want to say they didn't like it, that's fine. You, you're allowed to not like it. Did you ever have kind of those doubts where you did question it because I suppose for me growing up as a female rugby player it was so male dominated like you say you need that kind of hardcore I call it stubbornness I was definitely and still am very stubborn but at the same time you do sometimes without taking them too seriously you have those nagging thoughts of oh can I kind of bothered with this is it would it be easier to do something else should I do you, do you know what I mean did you ever have some of that yeah, and you, you guys will all know about this. This isn't a woman thing. You, you always suffer from imposter syndrome, where you just sort of like, I don't belong. You're all nodding. So yeah, we all know what that is. Um, and you just really have to fight it, um, that whole not belonging thing. And when it comes to your own personal ability, like I, I'll listen back to things. I, always, I tend to come off a commentary, particularly a TV commentary, thinking it's been an absolute disaster. <laughs> always and they're going oh no I could have done that, that. And you listen back to it you go oh it wasn't that bad that's all right that's okay and if, if I didn't think it was okay then I probably wouldn't continue doing it but I tend to come away going no no that that sounds all right and if that person hated it that's fine because yeah, it, it went well today I love that um aspiring broadcasters take notes Sarah Orchard listens watches back some of her stuff it is painful but essential research. Now let's go back to the abuse though. Liam Williams was abused um, on social media. Um, absolutely painful reading the kind of stuff that he was uh, subjected to. Ellis Genge on Good Bad Rugby talked about getting death threats during the Six Nations, people telling him to go back to Africa. Sonia McLachlan, your BBC colleague, um, was abused on Twitter after her post-match interviews in that um, Wales-England game. So does that stuff make you more determined? Or are you just one of those people who goes, Psh, it's going to happen? I have to be honest. I've never had it as bad as any of them is the first thing. So I think I'm lucky that's not an invitation for people to up their game. Uh, but yeah, I've not had it that bad yet. Um, I, as I said, you really have to, if you, you do get stuff, you have to look at where it's coming from, what fractions of society are sending it to you. Sorry, factions of society are sending it to you. Um, and it's often, and I'm not dismissing people, but is it coming from people that really matter? As I said, I just don't think it is. And yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of people out there signing the petitions at the moment on social media in the UK about, you know, you have to be able to provide ID to have a social media account in the future. And we all hope that that is where social media ends up, but you can see the complications of that across international borders when it comes to how you would actually be able to police social media it's going to be really hard 
but yeah, as I said, does it make me more determined? Probably not. I, I'll be honest, I, I, I don't look at social media directly after a game. I'll leave it a good 24 hours. I don't think it's a healthy place to be 20, uh, as soon as you finish a game. Go away, make your own conclusions, then look at it. I mean, if it's your job to look at it, then fine. But I, I, I don't need it. I've got other things to worry about. Skaz, you suffered a loss over the weekend. Uh, do you get abuse on top of that? Um, has, does it filter down to you? Do you get any kind of online aggression or at least sexism? The only abuse I got was from the rest of the girls at the weekend. But um, yeah, to be fair, like I suppose this is maybe a, where women's rugby is at. In terms of club rugby, no, because uh, there's probably not the people who are watching it and paying attention are, you know, the people that are really interested in it. They understand that, you know, win, lose or draw, they're behind you and they want to support you. Um, have I had that sort of abuse? Yes. Not again, like Sarah, not, not to the extent. Um, and it's largely focused around the, like, who cares stuff, you know, why are women playing rugby? It's a bloke sport. Um, it looks slow Com commenting on you know their perception of our game and perhaps how we are as female athletes you get a lot around how you look as a female athlete um, obviously you work extremely hard to be in the best possible nick that you can be that's like a you know your athletic physique is like a tangible representation of how hard you've worked and yet that's the thing that you get slammed for which again is is not something that I think is is good I don't think it's good in our society at the moment I think we need to be promoting and I know largely it is that healthy positive body image for especially young girls growing up um but yeah it's definitely there again i don't pay a huge amount of attention to it um i've been pretty lucky probably that i haven't seen really really tough kind of dark stuff but it doesn't mean that it isn't there and it doesn't mean that it's okay but i'm the sort of i'm a non-engager i just kind of let it let it go i think they often want you to engage um that's where they get their kicks from and yeah, I just can't be bothered, basically. <laughs> I, was, I was astounded that Ellis said that he replies to some of them. James, were you surprised? Uh, no, because... Not uh, when I you know used... Ellis. Yeah, not when you know <laughs> Ellis. I... Why well, would you I, go I think, there? Well, because, listen, when you understand, like, social dynamics and the importance of social media, so how many people do we know who put on Facebook going, something's terrible happened, right? And you write on it and go, what's happened, babe? And they go... DM me and it's like that's just attention seeking <laughs> I, you know I'll never love again some friends you just can't trust and you're like what's happened and that's so that's a cry for help that's like <laughs> I'm attention seeker right then you've got people who are attacking attacking other people I used to because what is what is fascinates me is that the, you know to take the time out of your day to search someone out and tell them your peace of mind and describe them and go into depth it takes a certain mentality you know I would sit and watch the tv so I uh, when England played Wales um uh, a few weeks ago, lost. I was uh, sitting there, I had a few drinks, and I was like, I started shouting at the TV, and I was <laughs> like, oh God, I've turned into one of those horrible fans. But not one part of me thought, oh, I'm going to go and write to the lads or like abuse them. I was like, it can find your living room. But we now have this generation of people who go and, and share it. What astounds me is that more often than not, these people who insult you, and what Sarah said about kind of the, the, the different demographic and stuff, is that they that they more often not have got more things going on wrong with them than they you have with you. So I used to take great joy in going through these insults. And I what I would do is I would, I mean, there's two stages to three stages. First of all, I'd look at them, their profile, pick up some kind of glaring error in their character, their, their setup and thing, and send it right back to them. Then I thought, well, actually, I can't do that because I, you know, as Chloe said, and she uses this example, does the rock do that? And I was like, no, the <laughs> rock does do that. And I as, love and, that. And as the rock, as the rock, my our whole life is like the rock. The rock's like my canary down the mine. I'm like, right, what's, what's happening? Is the rock doing it? No, well, I can't do it. So then was that. Then what I did is I used to block them. Now what I do is, because obviously you get the feature to like comments, I first of all block everybody that liked the comment, and then I block them. Um, but, and I don't reply because you're never going to beat stupidity. And also, if you show signs of weakness, like, like, with Tony McLaughlin, like I, I felt terrible for her. I messaged her straight on DM and I was like, listen, you're doing a job, you're a journalist, you're asking hard questions. Rugby uh, as, a, as a sport is, is not as professional as it thinks it is. It's not prepared for the hard talk. You have to mark this question. She showed her emotional side and laid herself vulnerable on, on social media. Unfortunately, with a world where, we, where it is, you kind of got to 
just own that because if you show more vulnerability, you, the human instinct is that people are going to turn around and go, oh, we've gone wrong. But the fact is these people don't know they've gone wrong. And the, and the, the people that are wrong will always be wrong. And the, the people who know what they, what's happened to you is terrible will voice it. And, and I think it's, it's, it's difficult to, to do that. But I, I've stopped. I've stopped solely because you will never beat stupidity and you'll never win. And it's an endless cycle of trying to, it's what it's like, it's the equivalent of whack-a-mole. Whack-a-mole with people. You, you whack one, another lemon, lemon turns up. Whack another one, you're never, you're never going to win. Not only that, you must have so much more time now that you're not doing that anymore. Yeah. Well, you say that. I mean, if you ask it, I, mean, I, I like to think I'm quite busy, but it's always time to, to search negativity about yourself and go through, you put your own <laughs> self to that mental tumble drive. We all do it. You know, like, and I feel for young players, especially you know, the, the young girls playing, I think for journalists as, as well, you know, because um, I, I was going to ask, interestingly enough, you've obviously said that both of your colleagues were really kind of receptive, but what was the rugby audience like? Because the rugby audience, to some degree, is red trouser wearing, ale drinking, you know, um, you know the last time they saw ladies was, you know, when they were cleaning the, the house and that's, that's the end of it. I, I wonder how the, how do the fans perceive uh you know women commentators and everything else because like, i you know i'd like to think we're progressive go to a twickenham car park some of it's prehistoric i'm just gonna put it out there yeah and some of it is prehistoric and i'll be i think an advantage perhaps of that area of rugby supporters you're talking about is they don't use social media they don't know how to use it <laughs> so that's really helpful um you know I don't know when it comes to like, yeah, that there's people on there who say get back in the kitchen, you know, and all that kind of stuff. It, but it, I just, I read that stuff and I laugh and I'm mm. just like, you can do better than that. If you're going to insult me, you can do better. So I just, I just don't care. I honestly yeah. couldn't care less. Yes, it sounds different. And, you know, as a female, I go out of my way in commentary not to escalate my voice up the levels because I know that's the first thing they start saying is you're shrieking my dog's barking you know again it's all the same stuff and it's something I really learned that as a woman regardless if I do shriek it does sound a bit naff and I've got learned to do that like my my biggest regret in my career so far was the women's 2014 world cup final and Emily will remember when Lydia Thompson made a break down the right wing and scored I did I'm neutral in these situations, but it was a very exciting moment in the match. And I, I hadn't done it in ages. I did get a bit too excited because <laughs> it was a, and I listened back to it and I was so disappointed in myself because I was a bit like, oh, Sarah. And it, you know, we're talking about 10 seconds, 10 seconds where I just gave it a bit too much in the wrong direction. I was like, you can do better than that. And there's better ways of expressing your excitement than going up the octaves. I love what you see screaming in the exact same pitch, so I wouldn't worry. It's real. Sorry. <laughs> I love what you what you said about um, go low and go slow. The more anxious and exciting the action gets as a commentator, you go slower and lower and let the fan noise come through. That is genius. Well, yeah, a really good uh, football commentator taught me that called uh, Nick Godwin, who I used to work with at BBC Radio London. And it's particularly pertinent in rugby where you're in about the 15th to 20th phase of watching forwards just pound away on a try line and still not going over. You can't just keep going up at every single ruck where they're not going over the line. You've just got to change gears and you've got to learn to be able to do that because there are periods where a commentator in a rugby match will talk far longer than in saying a football match. So yeah, you, you can be talking at periods for three minutes, which is a long time, either on the radio or the TV for someone to hear just your voice. Um, and even a male voice, you know, you need that variety. There's a reason why you have either one or two summarizers sat with you. It, it, they're also called color because it adds more to the game. You don't just want to hear one person. It's really, really important. And yeah, I mean, Emily and James, you, you've both done this. You, you know that just one person can't carry a match. You've got to be a team. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm fascinated. And I want to, this is a question for all three of you, really, because when I go into a room and I, and I go to commentate, right, I'm not worried about, um, I obviously worry about if I'm any good at it, but like my tone of voice, you know, is, is not an issue. Uh, you know, how I, how I come across, how I dress. And when I 
talk to, 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 to Natalie. Every answer was kind of, I want to own my femininity and I want to be serious, but I don't want to be too serious because you know, you become a, you know, a bitch. If, you, if, you're, if you're too lighthearted, you're too risque. And I wondered, it is each one, and start with you, sorry, like, do you, do you have those things behind, for going through your head because you're going into such an environment or, or is it, does it doesn't bother you? Because I was astounded how much thought process went into this, something that men will never understand. Uh, I, I'll leave TV presenting mainly to Elma because, I've, yeah, I've done a bit of TV presenting, but yeah, you do get just totally uh, judged on what you look like. One of the reasons I actually like commentary is because I don't really have to worry about what I look like and I can put on, I can look like the abominable snowman when it's minus two at Twickenham and nobody knows. It's fantastic because you do get cold. Um, what was the question? Uh, so, uh, so the question yeah. was, how <laughs> considered, how do you feel like yeah. you have to be so considered? Is there a thousand thoughts running through your head? Whereas for a man, yeah. I'm not worried about any of it. I don't I worry about whether my, my colleagues think that I'm as serious or not serious, whether I want, to, I want to own my masculinity or my femininity, but I don't want to be too, you know what I mean? Like, I, I think that's a, a real common theme, especially women who work in the media yeah. or in front of media. Yeah, so, so sorry, yeah. I think the main thing that I worried about when I was younger was saying something stupid. And a lot of the times I'd be quiet for a long period of time, longer than I should have been and say something, or I would say something stupid and that would make me say something even less because I hadn't been well looked after in certain environments. So you do worry about that. When it comes to like the whole notion of being bitchy and that sort of female side of it, I have always taken the attitude that I am nice to everyone. And if someone is not nice to me, I will continue being nice to them and I will eventually break you and you will be my friend. Because there is not enough room in this industry for anyone to be mean to each other. Rugby is too small a sport for anyone to start making enemies. So I try and get everyone on side. So if you're ever mean to me, I'll remember and I'll be extra nice to you next time you see me. That's my, that's my tactics. What was your excuse for that time on Sky, Haskett Twickers? What were you feeling then? Oh, what, when I, when I was unable to speak? <laughs> The greatest, the greatest single moment in TV of all the things I've ever achieved and done. That is the one moment that everybody laughs when I had a stroke live on, on live on air. Um, I mean, I've done, I've rehashed that so many times, but people still, like people who don't know me, follow me, they go, go bloody hell, that's unbelievable, mate. Can't believe you were that drunk doing TV. I was like, no, I, I wasn't. They put me on delay. I was unable to speak. You, you, it, it's impossibly, it's impossible to cognitively like be able to, you know, represent yourself. And everyone goes, yeah, oh, you're such a madman. I'm like, I wasn't drunk. Do you know what? I have to tell you this, James. The day after that, because I think it was a Sunday, and the day after I had to go to the England men's press conference, and all of the press pack turned around to me and said, Sarah, you work in TV. Was James drunk? To which I said, no. And what I got them to do was I got one of the senior journalists called Alex Lowe from the Times and I got him to count backwards from 20 to one out loud. And when he got down to about 13, I started counting forwards from one to 20. And funnily enough, he couldn't count backwards anymore. And I was like, that was what was going on in James Haskell's head in those ears at that time. So I stood up for you big time. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I, I need that because my reputation is, is, damaged at the best of times and I need everyone to just to pick, pick up the pieces but there is actually an app on your phone called I think it's brain jam or a head jammer you have to put your headphones on it and it's impossible to speak but still people go of course it <laughs> oi of course it is Haskell I was like mm -hmm. on the, being on the hospitality I was like no no I was working for Sky there was no hospitality there was nothing like it was I wouldn't mind I would have been drunk if there was an option to be drunk but there wasn't Speaking of being drunk on air, Emily, do you feel an increased amount of pressure as one of the leading faces of women's rugby, the best women's rugby player on earth, um, when you do media outside of this very safe space, of course, um, that the way you dress, the way you carry yourself, your voice, your demeanor, um, how much hair and makeup, what your body looks like, I mean, all of those things probably scrutinized so much more well, you're pulling a drunk story of me out then where you start that but um, <laughs> yes I, I honestly yes I think um obviously it's a space I've not been in uh, obviously as much as, as Sarah but um I think the biggest thing for me is obviously doing some punditry stuff and whatever in rugby I w wanted to come across as if I knew what I was talking about and like I've been playing rugby for a long time. I do know what's going on, but but it, I wanted to make sure that that was portrayed. And I think to start with, 
I probably tried to overdo that and like ram it down people's throat that, you know, I know the laws at the ruck and I understand tackling and all of those sorts of things, which, which, and I suppose I was probably trying to justify why I was there and justify that I understood about rugby. Um, whereas hopefully that's probably less so now, but I do. Yeah. I think as women, we're kind of serial overthinkers. So we do overthink what we look like, how we're appearing, the tone of our voice, all, all of those sorts of things that realistically, yes, there's always going to be some noise that picks up on it, but the majority of people will not put the same amount of thought into it as, as you perhaps have. Um, so I've tried to kind of like, yeah, not let that kind of be the overriding thing. Just make sure you know your stuff, you've done your homework, and then hopefully it will it and you will speak for yourself. Emily, you're nailing it pitch side. You really are. You don't need to worry about anything. Everyone I've spoken to, Emily Scarrett, pitch side, nice. You don't need to worry. Nice. Yeah, I feel, I feel like, uh, yeah, that's about as, as much uh, recommendation as anyone needs. Huge moment in women's sport over the last week in Britain. Uh, women's football finalized a huge broadcasting deal with BBC and Sky to the value of £7 million a year. How far are we from getting this for rugby and what can rugby learn from the WSL? Uh, wonderful news for the football. Uh, I I don't want to put a downer on this at all, but I do think women's rugby is a few years behind football. The Women's Super League is a fantastic product. It's now considered the best women's league in the whole world. When it comes to the UK and in England, the Premier 15s, it's still quite a young league. I do think it's the best league in the world, and that's why it's attracting so many international players. Like It's crazy when you look at the players who are turning out to the Premier 15s every weekend. It, it's just fantastic. But it, it still needs a few more years to grow. I do think those broadcasting deals are there for it. They are going to come. And um, yeah, the fact that this Six Nations coming up, every match you're going to be able to see on a BBC platform, whether it be on the iPlayer, the red button, or there's uh, going to be also whoever's in the final is going to be on BBC Two. Those sorts of things are building in the right direction. Uh, but as I said, it's getting there. And yeah, it could be there by next season. I think the announcement of WXV and the global calendar, this is all going to start coming together in a really exciting way. But we do need a few other unions at the top end of the international game to just invest a bit more in the women's teams rather than just the likes of England, France and New Zealand to see all real change. Are you cautious? I, I'm similar. I think we are definitely behind the footballers with that sort of stuff. And I think my caution with ploughing straight into a TV deal for our domestic league would be around almost like is the product ready for that audience and the product of teams one to 10 in every single game would you share that caution in terms of that part of it or is it because of something else um yeah i, I think you, there is a, an issue and i've spoken to there a few a few times just sort of about i, I don't think I'm, I'm telling anyone anything they don't know that darlington modem Park Durham Sharks at the moment are at the bottom of the league. They're struggling. They need support. They need help. And even in the men's premiership, it, it's not fun when you know that a team is going to get relegated when it's there and people see them as easy games. They don't attract the TV viewers. Um, so yeah, the league does still need a bit of ironing out, but I think the size of it is pretty good at the moment. I don't think it really needs to get too much bigger um, until you've increased the player base underneath it. I think the structures are good. I think it's almost just saying, right, we've got this. Let's just stick with this and keep making it better. The quality of the rugby. I mean, I watched um, uh, the last game I watched was the Wasps Exeter game uh, on the stream. And yeah, that was just fantastic. Uh, and you got Exeter this weekend, Skaz. Yeah, big yeah. game as well. Big game. Loughborough against Exeter. Exeter have been beating all the teams at the top of the Premier League. I know they lost last weekend, but um, yeah. But, and, and teams like Exeter are making it really exciting. If people don't know, obviously Exeter men, they've done incredible things. Uh, but now it looks like the women might be about to do the same thing. And that's exciting. That's it for the good, the scars and the rugby together with our friends at Allianz for this week. Uh, thanks to Emily. Thank you to James for joining us. And of course, our special guest, Sarah. 
Orchard. Now, if you haven't heard yet, James is uh, joined by Alex Mike and Ellis Genge to dig into what went wrong uh, with England in the Six Nations in this week's uh, The Good, The Bad and The Rugby. You can download that podcast right now if you haven't listened to it. Otherwise, catch it on YouTube if you are watching along with us on the same channel. We will be back next week with a Rugby World Cup winner as we build up to the first round of the Women's Six Nations, which gets underway next weekend. Emily, you can look more excited. It's going to be fun. <laughs> Come on. Yay. Okay. Thank you so much uh, for your company. See you back here in seven days time. Goodbye.